So for these retreats, we do three of them every single year. We have our men's retreat. We have our student retreat, which happens in June, um, which is a wild time. Talk about being on media for the student retreat. It's like you're up till 1 a.m. editing, and then you're back up at 6 a.m. getting ready again. Uh, so a lot of caffeine on that retreat. But we have the student retreat. We have the women's retreat. And we genuinely go out, all out for every single retreat. The full media staff, media volunteers, like just for men's ministry retreat, I think we have six or seven media personnel going. We got the whole worship team staff, whole worship team volunteers. Um, we have support staff coming up, like uh, Jen Doggett, who's John Doggett's wife, uh, my mom, Terry Broom, big haired lady that smiles a lot, that's out front on Sundays. It's, it's a full ordeal. There's months of planning that goes into it. And we do a lot to prepare for these retreats. But what I want to talk about tonight is, is spiritual preparation because as much as those things, we put a lot of effort into them, if we did all of that and we ran the retreat very well, like it's organized, people know what to do, where to go, all this other stuff. If we do all that, but God's really not there, those things have no real value. And so I believe in planning, I believe in organization, but those things really only hold much value if the presence of God is there and flowing through those things. And so the thing that we can do that is truly the greatest and makes everything else actually valuable is to prepare spiritually to truly meet with God and have God move in our lives. And I don't just mean us as a staff prepare or as leaders or as table leaders. I believe it starts with us, but I think it applies to every single person who will be going there. And even if you're not going there, it applies to your life in the sense of preparing spiritually for God to move in your life because God's not confined to Black Mountain, North Carolina, right? Like a move of God can happen in your life no matter where you are. And so this message, although geared towards setting us up spiritually for the retreat next week, will apply to anybody who I believe wants to chase after God and see God move in their life. And so the greatest thing we can do is spiritually prepare, but I want to talk first, uh, before we get to kind of talking about spiritual preparation, or you see it in the Old Testament sometimes called as like a consecration or, or setting yourself apart, is the greatest barrier to preparation, or one of the, the biggest ones in my opinion, is not going to God at all to begin with. And the thought of this kind of came out of, I was sitting in this room, um, and we do set up every Tuesdays and Thursdays to, to prep for midweek and then to prep for Sunday. And, and um, my mom and I were in here, we're in charge of setting up PHQ, making sure coffee's ready to go and all that stuff, because that machine is sometimes not very nice. So we have to come in here and fix it. And by we, I mean mom. She comes in here and fixes it. But we were in here talking, I was talking about, um, we were just kind of talking about maybe what I was going to be potentially speaking on tonight and what she was talking about. And I said something that had occurred to me was one of the really smart things that the enemy does and that our own sin does because Scripture talks about don't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. But one of the really smart things that the enemy and sin do to us is convince us to not go to the one being in the entire universe that can actually help us. And I know that's true for you because of how true that's been in my life. Of how when you realize you've messed up or you have uh, habitual sin in your life or any of these other things that you know the way I'm living right now does not line up with what I inherently know that God approves of. And the enemy does a great job. You think of Adam and Eve in the garden, the first thing that happened when they sinned was they ran from God. 
And one of the greatest things the enemy does and our own sin and our own flesh does is convince us in some way, shape, or form that we should not go to him. Maybe it's the classic argument of you've gone too far, you've done too much, you messed up, there's no way you can make any type of restitution. Or just that if you go to him, all these things that you've done are going to be brought up and you're, there's going to be this massive sense of shame or guilt brought to the surface of stuff you've been trying to push down for two or three decades. But the biggest barrier to us really, I believe, preparing our hearts for a move of God within us and through us is just the reality of the deceptiveness that we feel like we can't go to him to begin with. That we feel like other people can do that, but that I can't for whatever reason. I'm too dirty. I, I, I need to clean myself up more first. I need to try to stop sinning some more before I go to him. And the only being in the entire universe that can really help you overcome sin, that can really sanctify you, that can really grow you, is the presence of God. And so the enemy convinces you to run from the one thing that can actually help you. And so that, that greatest barrier we have to overcome to realize that that is a lie and that we need to go to God no matter how much we have lived in a way that we know is not the righteous standard of God's law. The one we need to fix us in that instance is the presence of God. And I think sometimes we can even, because we feel this way, we can substitute in service for God instead of actually getting to God. And what I mean by that is, instead of actually going and developing a genuine relationship with the Lord and truly seeking the Lord, we substitute in service. Maybe we volunteer every time the doors are open um, or we do other stuff that's some type of external action that we, you know, we serve on every team or we're there every time the doors are open or, or anything else like that and we substitute in this service because somehow we think it will appease a broken conscience. And I'm not here to say volunteering is bad. We believe in volunteering more than about any other church I know of in this area. We have like half the church serves on volunteer teams. We believe that there is a place for you within the body of Christ to serve and that's valuable. I'm in no way saying it's not. But service to God is a very poor substitute for intimacy with God. Your service to God should come out of the intimacy you have with Him, but it's not a substitute for it. And so I want to just go to one scripture before we talk about kind of examples in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament about consecration and kind of spiritual preparation. And that is Hebrews 4.16. Pastor Jordan read it. I believe it was this past Sunday. It says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what I want you to realize is don't let the enemy or your own sin convince you that for whatever reason you can't go to God right now. Like in this moment, in your car or your truck on the way home tomorrow morning, no matter what you did earlier today or when you got here or no matter what you'll do even maybe when you leave. This scripture is talking about the place that you find mercy and grace is at the throne of grace. It's in God's presence. Pastor Jordan kind of closed out his message with this scripture. And that reality that no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're even you're doing, that the place that you actually find what you need is God. No matter what situation you find yourself in. And so I want to talk about several different examples from the Old Testament, looking at what did it look like for God's people to begin to prepare their hearts and minds to see God move. And oftentimes in the Old Testament, um, you'll see the word consecration, and it it's basically to set yourself apart. Like You'll see it even sometimes interchanged with holy. Literally, holy means to be set apart, to be different. And so one of these examples is actually in the book of Joshua. It comes out of Joshua chapter 3. And Joshua was the successor of Moses. 
So once Moses, if you know anything, if you grew up in church at all or even didn't, most people know at least who Moses was. And after Moses passed away, God raised up Joshua after him to take his place. And so in Joshua 3, they're about to cross the Jordan River. And most people know about the crossing of the Red Sea when the Israelites came out of Egypt. It's very, very famous. We've been going through Exodus on Sunday mornings. But there's also another time where God parted, and that was the Jordan. And the day before God parted the waters for the Israelites to go across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land, Joshua says, Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So he's saying, Today, set yourself apart. Because tomorrow we're about to see God do something that for generations to come we won't forget. God's about to do something that will show you how faithful, how powerful, how capable he truly is. So today, consecrate yourself. And in that scripture, it gives no specifics on what they were supposed to do for that consecration. It just says, consecrate yourselves. Tomorrow, God's going to do wonders among you. And then you have Moses, Aaron, and his sons in Exodus when God told Moses to consecrate Aaron and his sons to be priests. And I believe that process took at least seven or eight days. There were a lot of different animal sacrifices, a lot of rituals that went into it every single day for them to be consecrated, to be priests before the Lord, to serve in the temple, and to be the go-betweens between the people of Israel and God. That was a long process animal sacrifice, a whole big detailed thing that you can go and read in Exodus. And that was how God commanded Moses to consecrate Aaron and his sons prior to being priests. And then there's another instance in Exodus where God tells Moses that the the entire people of Israel need to consecrate themselves. And the instruction that God gives to Moses, that Moses gives to the people in this instance, is for the next three days... Consecrate yourselves, wash your clothes, and don't go near a woman. And presumably that meant don't go have sex with a woman. Um, I know for some of you, you're like, man, for three days? And then people that have been married a long time, you're like, that's par for the course, if not more. But he said, people are laughing like, yeah, I've been there. Um, but that was the instruction to the Israelite people at that time was, You need to consecrate yourselves. And the two instructions were wash your clothes and don't go near a woman for this time. It's three days. And then you see in Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Ezra are both kind of written and and talk about the same time period. And in Nehemiah, there's no actual reference to the word consecration, but I still wanted to share what happens in Nehemiah. And so... Nehemiah comes when the people of Israel are coming back out of the land of Babylon after their 70 years of captivity. So short in a nutshell, what happened is you have Joshua. He led the Israelite people out of the desert and into the promised land. And then for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the Israelites just disobeyed God. And then they felt bad and then cried out to him. He had pity. He rescued them. And then they're like, we're also going to go back to the foreign gods again. So they went back to the foreign gods. And it was just like that cycle over and over again. You have a real peak halfway through with like David. It was amazing. Solomon, pretty solid. But then he was like, I'm going to have a thousand, nearly, well, 700 wives, 300 concubines. I just feel like for any person, that's a bad idea. But then that also went down because it said they turned his heart away from the Lord to false idols. And then after that, it was mostly bad. Like if you actually go read through, there were a few good kings. And even the good kings mostly ended bad. But mostly it was just horrible kings. So for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, it was mostly the people of Israel turning away from God. And then he'd rescue them, and they'd come back and be like, hey, our bad, sorry about that. We'll serve you now. And then they would like serve him for a little bit, and then they'd be like, no, we're going back again. So that happened over and over and over and over and over again until finally God was like, Nebuchadnezzar's coming, and you're about to be kicked out of your entire country unless you repent. And I've actually been reading through Jeremiah recently, which is the prophetic book. Jeremiah lived through this exile into Babylon. 
And so it says for 23 years, Jeremiah was like, hey, he's a prophet of God. He comes, he's like, the Lord said, if you don't repent, it's going to get real bad. And, and you're like, people, like, the army's coming, you will be killed unless you do what God says. And they were still like, no, nope. you're prophesying lies. And they tried to kill Jeremiah on multiple times, but God says, I'll protect you, and he did. So for 23 years, just this is all the way at the end. They do this to Jeremiah. And then finally, I find this, I mean, it's terrible, but also a little bit humorous. They come to Jeremiah, and they're like, hey, Nebuchadnezzar's besieging the city. Like, we don't know what to do. And Jeremiah's, they're like, pray to God and see what he says. Whatever he says, we'll do it. All right? You have, you have our word. Whatever the Lord says, we'll do it. And then Jeremiah's like, okay. He's like, this moment right here is going to be a witness against you if you don't do it. And so it says, Jeremiah basically sought the Lord, and it says, at the end of the ten days, the Lord answered him, which is probably a message in and of itself. But maybe answers don't always come immediately. So what God says is, hey, don't go to Egypt, because these guys wanted to go to Egypt. And they're like, that's going to end bad. Don't go to Egypt. If you, if you basically, if you go into exile in Babylon, you'll keep your life. And so Jeremiah goes back and he's like, hey, here's what the Lord said. And they go, you're lying to us, Jeremiah. The Lord did not tell you that. We are actually going to go to Egypt. And it didn't pan out well for him. My point in saying that is after generations of stubborn hearts and turning away from the Lord, to the very end, the Lord offered a way back and a way to repentance. Time and time and time, and time, and time, and time again. But the cool thing about God is, even in that 70-year exile to Babylon, that's the period of Daniel, and the book of Daniel, and everything God did through Daniel, and Nebuchadnezzar, and how Nebuchadnezzar ended up believing in God. Daniel's in alliance in. All that stuff happened when they were kicked out of their own country. So the faithfulness of God, even in that judgment, look what he did. If you don't know, go read the book of Daniel. And so after that 70 years of captivity, this is the time of Nehemiah when the exiles are coming back to their own homeland. And so throughout Nehemiah, they're rebuilding the temple and all this stuff. And then Ezra comes and he reads the law of Moses to the people. And so all the people come to listen and they realize basically that God's law and then the way they've been living their life are very much so very different. And they start weeping and mourning, and then the leaders go out and be like, hey, this is actually a day of celebration. It's okay. The joy of the Lord is actually your strength in this moment. That's where that scripture comes from. It says, go away and basically celebrate. So they have a feast for seven days. They eat, they hang out and do all this stuff. And then after that, they proclaim a fast, there's more reading of Scripture, and then they have confession of sin, worship after that. And so there was a time where they had celebration, then they had fasting, then they had a time where they says they confessed their sins and the sins of their fathers, and then they worshiped the Lord. And the reason I say that is to show different ways that you have this kind of consecration, this turning back, this setting yourself apart to the Lord. And you even see in the New, Pest New Testament, it was talking in Acts chapter 13, it says, Now they were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing these correctly, so bear with me, and Saul, I got that one right. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And just the power of that while they were praying and fasting and worshiping, that was when the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And, and you see, if you've been here for any length of time, Pastor Jordan's done, um, I know at least one, if not several, powerful messages on fasting. He's talked to our staff about it a lot. But I wanted to share those as examples before we dive into truly the heart of consecration and preparing yourself to hear from the Lord. Because those are several different ways or examples throughout Scripture 
that God had the people of Israel basically set themselves apart or get spiritually ready for a work of God, depending on what it was. And there were different things for different times. And the reason I want you guys to understand that is because this consecration or setting yourself apart or kind of preparing your heart spiritually to really meet with God or have God do a work in your life, it's not external actions that are just formulaic. All right? Like if you think, okay, the way to go meet with God now is like I go sacrifice a bunch of animals. Don't, don't go do that, please. Or the way that I meet with God is I need to not have sex for three days and go wash my clothes. Like for us, hopefully you wash your clothes about every day. For the Israelites, I think that was a little different. But it's not taking these external actions that they did in the Old Testament and saying, okay, Scott's giving me a list of things to go do. Basically making a to-do list. I'm going to go check off these things to go prepare to meet with God. That's not it at all. Because you see, in Psalm 51, and this psalm was written by King David. He wrote a lot of the psalms. But this psalm's pretty darn famous because he wrote this psalm after Nathan the prophet had come and confronted him about his horrible sin with Bathsheba and then killing Uriah the Hittite. So David, a little adultery action. He saw Bathsheba on the roof of her house. She was naked, bathing. He's like, that looks pretty good. Got a lot of wives already, but also... Isn't that just classic, man? I mean, for real, though? Like, got a lot already, but that one I don't have. I want that one. And so then he's like, all right, tell Bathsheba to come here. And he's the king, so he can do whatever he wants. So then he sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. And then he's like, hey, Uriah, her husband, needs to come home. So then he tries to do all this stuff. It doesn't work. So then in a roundabout action, he has Uriah killed. And then Nathan the prophet comes to him and, and confronts David about it. And so the, all of Psalm 51 is David's brokenhearted repentance to God after he realizes what he's done through this. We're not reading all of it, but I want to read verses 16 and 17. He says, For you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And so we see... In Exodus, we just went through it. One of the ways that God had Moses consecrate Aaron and his sons was through a bunch of animal sacrifice. But, And that was what Moses was supposed to do. That's what God commanded him to do. But you see from David here, David says, in the midst of my deep, deep sin, he says, if sacrifice was the thing I knew you actually wanted, I'd give it. David's saying, anything you wanted me to give you, I would do it. But he says, the thing... The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. And so David said, I would, I would, if the sacrifices were what you wanted, if me giving up all this stuff is what you wanted, I'd do it. But I know that you, the thing you really want, God, in the midst of my deep sin, is you want this, my broken heart. The humility of me coming to you and, and just being honest with you about what I've done. And it's, that's the heart of this spiritual preparation, this consecration, this setting yourself apart is saying the sacrifice that God really wants is you. That, that humility, he, he talks about it a ton in Scripture. God talks about how much the people of Israel stiffen their necks and they would not humble themselves before the Lord. So if we'll humble, our, humble ourselves before the Lord and say, God, here is my heart, here's my brokenness, here's everything within me that's jacked up, David says that's the thing that God really wants. It's not a list of this big external actions that you can hold up to God and say, look at all these things I did. But what God wants is this almost intangible thing of like, he wants you. The brokenness, the mess, the everything else, just this humility before him of like being honest with him and saying, this is who I am. Even if you don't tell anybody else, you can tell God, this is who I am. This is the sin. This is the insecurity. This is the deepest fears I have in my life that I haven't told anybody. 
and just this humility and brokenness towards God. David says that's the sacrifice that God wants. And then you look in Romans um, 12, 1, which Pastor Jordan's read a ton on Sunday mornings. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And it ties in a ton with Psalm 51, where Paul says, the living sacrifice of you, that is your spiritual worship. And he says something, he says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And I looked up how it's actually written in the Greek and then what that word mercy or mercies really means. And so in the, in the Greek, it really says, I appeal to you, brothers, through the mercies or through the compassion of God, through the compassion of God to present your um, bodies as a living sacrifice. And if you look up that word compassion, it literally means pity, deep feeling about someone's difficulty or misfortune. Visceral compassion is used to the deep feelings that God has for all of us. And so Paul says, the way that you can lay your body down as a living sacrifice, he says, because he literally says, through the compassions of God or the Lord. So it's almost as like, okay, if you're going through the door and on the other side of that door is you being a living sacrifice, the door that you should go through is God's compassion. His literally his visceral emotional pity for you. Because the thing that's been on my mind since I started thinking about, okay, Lord, what do you want to speak to the guys the first Wednesday back? We're about to go on a retreat. I think it's around consecration or spiritual preparation, but I'm not exactly sure. The main thing that I felt the most was to not be afraid of the work that God wants to do in your life. Because I, I know my mom said this before, and she didn't make it up. She got it from somewhere else. But it's that most of us have two main fears. That if we go to God, that he's, he's really like maybe not there, doesn't care, doesn't move. And then our other great fear is that he is there, and he will move, and he'll actually get up in our business and our life. That, that's kind of the two fears that we genuinely have. And the thing I felt was to tell him not to be afraid. I didn't hear the audible voice of God or anything like that. But the thing that I felt was tell him not to be afraid to go after God in a real way, not service to God, but to go after God and to start to seek God in their life and open themselves up to whatever God wants to do in their life as we head into this retreat, as we just head into this new year. Because if you're really going to lay your life down as a living sacrifice, if you're really going to start going to God and opening up your heart to him and giving yourself to him, Anybody who does that flippantly or lightheartedly or anything else, I would argue maybe you're not doing it at all. Because to start to turn over your whole life to a God you maybe don't really know that well is inherently scary. Even if you don't admit it to anybody else, I know because I've been there. Right? To, to truly start to give up control of your own life and to say, God, is as much as I can... No, I'm, I want to give myself over to you to do what you want in and through my life. Because it's one of those things where you kind of have to start to give your trust to a God who you don't know whether he's trustworthy or not. Right? Trust is one of the most valuable things we have. And if you, if you had like a, a, a bucket or a ball of trust, that's like, you're, you're handing it to somebody you really don't know yet because you haven't trusted them. And so the only real way to get to know God and to get to see the trustworthiness and faithfulness of God, because he is those things, is to begin to hand that thing over to him. 
and to begin to hand yourself, your heart, your trust, because that's what you're doing when you're handing that over to Him. And so Paul's saying, yes, give yourself to the Lord, but the way that you do that, the thing that should push you through the inherent fear of that, the thing that should push you through so that you keep going, is knowing the deep compassion that God has for you. And that really, just like Romans 8.28 says, getting to the place where you're going to say, Lord, I don't know how, I don't know what it looks like, but I'm going to trust that whatever you actually have for me is ultimately for my good. Because it is. It may be hard to get to that place, but start to preach to yourself and know that as I start to seek the Lord, whatever He starts to put in my heart or move in my life, it is ultimately for my good, and I'll be better on the other side of it. And that what God wants is just you. And it can start in a lot of different ways. I think early on I was very guilty of comparing other people's walks with the Lord to how the Lord may operate with me. And the Lord is a very individualistic God, I believe, in the sense that your journey won't be mine and mine won't be yours. Now, I believe there's similarities, obviously, but I would, I would see maybe what God was doing in somebody else's life and be like, oh, man, they, they went through that. Like, God, I don't know if I could go through something like that. But that's not your journey. And so trust God with everything that you are. And as we head into retreat or as you just start to seek God in your own life, I think the first and the biggest thing is just start to go to Him. Now, for some of you that have a very regular prayer time um, and Scripture reading time, some people call it quiet time, you know, as, as, you, as you go to meet with God, maybe God does want you to do something like fasting or something else heading into the retreat. I know us and some of the leaders, I believe, will be next week heading into the retreat. Maybe it's something like that. Maybe you hardly ever read your Bible, you hardly ever pray, and as you start to seek the Lord, maybe something you could do is you set aside some time at lunch, or you say, I'm going to wake up 30 minutes earlier, or if you have the flexibility, I'm going to go into work or start work 30 minutes later. But start to set aside some type of time. Maybe it's just in the car at first to say, I'm going to set aside this time to start to meet with you to the best of my abilities and just be honest with me. If you have no idea what the heck you're doing, just be like, Lord, I have no idea what the heck I'm doing. All right? I want, I want to get to know you, but I don't even know what getting to know you looks like, but please help me. And start having that conversation. Start reading the Bible. Maybe God has you, he wants you to, you know, replace some time that we all spend scrolling social media and get nothing out of it and replace 20 or 30 minutes of that with some scripture reading. But what I don't want you to do is take the external action of going and doing something and do that without having the heart of, I really want to get to know God. Because the external action should come out of the desire for intimacy, not as something to check off the list so that if anybody on retreat asked me if I did anything, I could tell them I did something before I came up here. But that will truly have a heart that wants to seek the Lord and that will start to spiritually prepare ourselves and say, Lord, I'm here. Even maybe I'm scared. I don't really know what to do. But I want to see you move. And if you don't feel like you want to see God move in your life, tell him. I've been there before, too, where I'm like, Lord, I, I want to want you to move in my life. But right now I, I feel stale, dry, stagnant, complacent, whatever it is, even if that's you. And you know I shouldn't be in that situation, but I am. Tell him that, too. He already knows, and I promise you, just being open and honest and vulnerable with him, even if it feels weird, it will be worth it. And just like Jeremiah, who was a prophet, went and sought the Lord, and it says, for ten days, the answer came on the tenth day, which means for nine days, Jeremiah was seeking an answer from the Lord, and he didn't get anything. Just because you don't get something on day one, doesn't mean God doesn't love you or that he's not there or that he's ignoring you or any of that other stuff. And so chase God. Scripture says that if we seek him, we seek him with all our heart, he will be found. We will find him. And so I would encourage you, even if it's a baby, baby step, don't compare it to the person next to you. 
But whatever that is for you, start to take that step towards God. Because whatever he wants to do, it is ultimately good, and you will never, ever, ever regret it. I promise you that. I can promise you that.